Σας ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Η ομιλία θα είναι 45 λεπτά, οπότε αν θέλετε έχουμε σκουπίσει τρομερά καλά το πάτωμα. Ε, μπορείτε να κάτσετε κάτω. Και εμείς, δηλαδή είναι, όποιος φοράει τζιν είναι τέλειο. Σας λέω, δεν θα έχει ούτε σκόνη. I'm just saying that everybody can sit on the floor because it's really clean. So, ε, είμαστε πολύ χαρούμενοι να έχουμε τον Bayam Sharif μαζί μας, που είναι από την ομάδα Slavs and Tatters. Ε, θα σας εξηγήσει καλύτερα αυτός για τη δουλειά του. Στην ουσία τον απαγάγαμε, γιατί ερχόταν για διακοπές ε, μια, ένα γάμο ή κάτι που είχε στην ε, ε, Μύκονο. Ε, και τον βάλαμε χωρίς να τον, να τον πληρώσουμε, χωρίς να τον κάνουμε τίποτα, να μιλήσει εδώ για, για μας και εσάς. Άρα είναι ο χορηγός της βραδιάς. Έτσι πάει η Κουσχάνη. I just said that you are the sponsor. Ε, νομίζω θα μιλήσει για πολλά θέματα τα οποία ε, εντάξει, που έχουν να κάνουν με, τον, με το Ισλάμ, τον κομμουνισμό, τη, σήμερα, τη σημερινή εποχή, αλλά καλύτερα να σας το πει ο ίδιος, γιατί μπορεί να ακούγεται πάρα πολύ εξωτικό με αυτόν τον τρόπο. Οπότε το αφήνω το μικρόφωνο σε αυτόν. Α, να σας πω ότι η ομάδα είναι ο Παγιάμ Σαρίθ και η Κάσια Κότζακ, η οποία δεν είναι εδώ μαζί μας και είναι μια ομαδική προσπάθεια. Α, α, και μην ξεχάσουμε ότι στη, φέτος, το καλοκαίρι, έχουν μία έκθεση στην ε, ΣΑΜΟ, η οποία ξεκινάει 4 Αυγούστου. Do you know the name of the project? Not the, your project, but the general. ΣΑΜΟΣ project. Α, στο, ε, στο κέντρο, στο Πυθαγόριο κέντρο. Οπότε εκεί μπορείτε να δείτε μία μεγάλη τους δουλειά, με πολλά γλυπτά. And I think you're gonna talk a bit. You can give like one or two details about ΣΑΜΟΣ. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. It's safe to say that if in the West or in China we celebrate the New Year with a pop of champagne or the crack of fireworks, the first month of the year, much, much of the Muslim world starts with a cry and a, and a sob. Muharram, can everybody hear me? Yes? Muharram, the second holiest month of the calendar after Ramadan, for, is a, and especially for Shias, who count as 20% of the Muslim population, is a time of mourning from the word haram, meaning forbidden, because during this month it's technically forbidden to engage in any kind of warfare, for example. Men gather together in, in spaces called Hosseiniyes, named after Hossein, spaces of meditation and prayer, and, uh, and they mourn because they were not present at, a, at the moment of a cosmic battle that happened in the seventh century. The reason they cry is this man here, Hussein ibn Ali, or rather the story revolving around the grandson of the Prophet. Hussein is the grandson of, of uh, Prophet Muhammad, and following a very contentious succession issue, um, Hussein and his followers refused to recognize the legitimacy of the Caliph, uh, Yazid I, 
who was the second Umayyad Caliph. And what they did is they marched to Kufa, which is in present-day Iraq, which is actually where coffee comes from, and it's the brief capital of the Caliphate at the time. And the people of Kufa had professed allegiance to, uh, to Hussein and requested guidance from him and from the family of the Prophet. The Caliph's several hundred uh, and thousands a strong army intercepted Hussein and his family and his followers. And uh, in the desert of Karbala, roughly 100 kilometers southwest of uh, Baghdad, they cut off uh, the access to water. So after several days of thirst in the desert, in the heat, the Caliph's army, led by a, a man named Shimra, killed all the men, some of whose bodies were mutilated. Hussein himself was decapitated and took the women and children captive. This event acted as a foundational schism, if you will, between Sunnah and Shia. And it's revisited every year as a trans-historical, transnational remembrance or commemoration. <laughs> Mourning is a serious business. Even the supreme leader, who is supposedly above the fray as God's representative on earth, even it brings the tears out of him. This is Khomeini on the left and Khamenei, the present leader, on the right. The festivities around Muharram co include a complex constellation of activities, sort of neighborhood parades, a passion play theater, uh, food for the, for the neighborhood, banners, and it builds up in a kind of climax to this moment, which is the Ashura, the 10th day of the month, and uh, building up to the Battle of Karbala. And this uh, crescendo takes place in a kind of ecstatic fever. But why Muharram? Why are we speaking about Muharram? It's not because Muharram tells the story of Shiism. I'm not here to talk about even Islam per se, or Iran, uh, but actually because it goes beyond the question of faith. What we're interested in is, is Muharram as an agency for, for what Professor Dabashi at Columbia University calls the perpetual protest uh, at the heart of Shiism. Muharram allows us to investigate the notion of protest beyond the strictly socioeconomic, quantitative, economic or political one, whether it was the Arab Spring of 2011, whether it was the, the protest against the crisis in 2008, mm -hmm. whether it was the opposition movement in Moscow in 2011 or in uh, Taksim uh, a couple weeks ago. We invariably discuss issues such as dignity, or even community that are necessary for successful disobedience. But what we'd like to do is attempt a kind of phenomenological or metaphysical understanding of protest. Or as Gandhi said, I learned from Muharram how to win despite being oppressed. Now it's important to remember Gandhi was not a Muslim, he was a Hindu, so this, this, this phenomenon goes beyond the questions of of religion to touch on history, time, and progress. Just a quick note on terminology, um, because a lot of these terms will be new, I assume, so it helps to see them maybe written. Muharram is the name of the first month of the year, the, of the Islamic calendar, and I will use it as an umbrella term to cover this range of sort of festivities and, and commemoration of Hussein. Taziyeh is the play that happens in Muharram, it's a passion play like we used to have in, in, uh, in Europe in the Middle Ages. And Ashura is the 10th day of the month and the climax of this uh, month of Muharram. Now, we've already spoken about terminology, so maybe we should talk a little bit about methodology. I think some members of the audience are old enough to remember the arrival of the term triangulation. It arrived in political discourse, at least in the Anglo-Saxon world, when uh, Bill Clinton arrived in 1992. Triangulation meant basically finding a way to co-opt sort of traditional understandings of left and right and, and a kind of uh, and a redemption of the center in politics. And Tony Blair, who was never one to miss on a great opportunity, 
um, or export of the U.S. quickly adopted this tactic in his labor success in 1997. For us, um, reverse joy and the current cycle of work is called the faculty of substitution. And um, what we do is we try to put pressure onto this notion that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So in the social sciences, researchers use triangulation as a, as a methodology kind of to cross-examine an approach to what Americans also call the shotgun approach. Shotgun meaning you sort of shoot everywhere and see where the things fall. Um, what we'd like to propose is something slightly counterintuitive, meaning instead of going from A to B, we'd like to sort of go to C before we get to B. Um, and so instead of going to the point of destination, actually to deliberately make a detour or speak about one thing through another thing, which we find is crucial for a comprehensive understanding of an idea or topic. This is something we've done recently with our, actually when uh, Marina and I met in uh, Sharjah with in our new book called Friendship of Nations, Polish Shiite Showbiz. It tells the story of, of contemporary Iran through the perspective of Poland during solidar solidarity in 1980s uh, anti-communist movement. This ability to bring together in one space, one page, one voice, two ends of the spectrum that are previously considered antithetical or mutually exclusive or distinct from it or sort of impossible to exist together, this is something that has become a kind of a modus operandi of our practice. We attempt to do so via the collision of scales, the macro concerns of polemics with the micro concerns of poetics. We try to do so with the geographical goalposts of our region between the former Berlin Wall and the Great Wall of China. And perhaps most importantly, via the two great sort of ideological narratives of our region and of the 20th and 21st centuries, as Marina mentioned, that of, is, uh, political, that of communism and political Islam. We call this, there's a lot of terms in English, uh, uh, one of this is in Latin, but there's a lot of terms. Uh, amphiboly is one of the terms, which means sort of uh, having two contradictory phrases in one sentence. Um, we like to call it the, the splits, you know, when you try to do the splits, like she's doing here, but the splits of the mind instead of the splits of the legs. So really trying to get your head around two things which normally you would never put together. A good example of this is early work. Um, this is a, a vacuum form plastic. See how far I can go with this. Um, it says, dig the booty of monoglots, but marry my child a polyglot. What it means is essentially, for those of you who are not familiar with sort of slang uh, English, it means if you're going to have a one night stand, or you're going to sleep around, make sure you do so with somebody who speaks one language. But if you're going to settle down and sort of get serious, try to do so with somebody who speaks more than one language. Um, and this is an example for me of, of these two registers of language you would never put together in English. People who usually use the word dig the booty don't use the words polyglot and monoglot in the same sentence. It's kind of, it's, one is kind of the street, it's the language of the street, and the other one is the language of the academy, let's say. Um, also, as you'll notice, because you, you're Greek, so you're the only people who can understand this probably that I present this to, but uh, it's not translated, it's transliterated. So it says, dig da booty of monoglots. It's transliterated into, into, into Cyrillic. And the same in, in, in Persian or Arabic on top, dig da booty. And transliteration is a is an interesting phenomenon. It's something that nobody really thinks about because it's 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 kind of like the younger trashy brother or sister to translation. Translation is noble. There's sort of books devoted to it. Baudelaire did it. Uh, Faulkner did it. Uh, it's you know it's a uh, Nabokov is, is famous for it. But nobody thinks about translation. I think you probably do it Greek Greeklish right when you write emails. Anybody who speaks a language who not written in, in Latin, usually has to deal with transliteration on a daily basis. Um, another example of these two things, bringing two things together in one, in one space is uh, people we don't normally put together, which are uh, Marx and Mohammed. This is a, these are a, this was for the, a, a project at the secession in Vienna uh, called Not Moscow, Not Mecca. And we told the story of syncretic Islam uh, in Central Asia through the perspective of fruits of the region. And, um, and what's interesting about the, about the approach of Central Asian Islam is that because it was demodernized, because religion was outlawed in the Soviet Union, um, the time when Islam was radicalized in the rest of the world was the early 20th century. It could not get radicalized in, in the Soviet Union because 
it was with the arrival of printing presses that Islam became radicalized. It's only when printing presses arrived that people start to z discuss what is a true Muslim, what is a fatwa, sort of who's a, who represents Islam pr properly. And because any religion couldn't be printed, uh, or books couldn't be printed about religion in uh, during uh, communist times, ironically, they missed out on that modernization. And what happened was they maintained a ritualistic, oral, community-based approach to Islam, which is actually, uh, unfortunately, um, forgotten in much of the Gulf, for example, or even in Iran. And another person that uh, we, we discovered in this project of Not Moscow, Not Mecca, was a gentleman on the left named Norman Brown. Norman Brown was a specialist of William Blake and James Joyce. And, um, and he published several books uh, on William Blake and sort of psychoanalysis. He did a whole book about psychoanalysis of history. He basically tried to psychoanalyze the whole of history. It became a kind of crossover success for intellectuals in America. Kind of, he became a kind of a public figure at that time. But the last 10 years of his life, he devoted to reading the Quran. He didn't convert to Islam. He just decided he's a professor at Santa Cruz University. And uh, he was a kind of favorite of all the hippie generation, the counterculture generation. But he never did drugs or was, he just happened to be kind of a, uh, a pretty mystical or sort of a esoteric figure. Anyway, he, what, the last 10 years of his life, he devotes to reading the Quran because he claims that the Quran, that nobody could read the Quran in translation until James Joyce existed because we didn't understand what the notion of a modernist text was until James Joyce existed. And if you think about it, the Quran, if you, if you compare the, the Quran to the Old Testament or the New Testament, the Torah or the Bible, time in the Quran is cyclical, time in the Old and New Testament is linear. So a story has a beginning and ending and a middle and end. In the Quran, it doesn't. It sort of it goes around. Characters become other characters. So Jesus becomes Hagar. Hagar becomes Joseph. Joseph becomes Muhammad. It's like that scene in Lost Highway. Do you remember when he wakes up one day and sort of he's a completely different person? Well, in the Bible, this doesn't happen. Jesus is Jesus from beginning to end. Joseph is Joseph from beginning to end. And uh, and so he 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 claims that in in James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, 110 of the 114 surahs of the Quran. The titles of the of the of the chapters of the Quran are in Finnegan's Wake, and he goes on to say he calls Marxism and Islam two still revolutionary forces, two tired old horses. Neither of them are doing very well, but would but it would be a mistake to take any comfort from their failure. The human race is at stake, and they both Marxism and Islam agree on one proposition: that there shall be one world, or there shall be none. So back to Muharram, in studying this transnational tragedy, here, for example, Ashura ceremonies in London or, uh, or, or in Tehran, we should look at Muharram or Islam itself. Again, this faculty of uh, substitution or, or looking at things triangulated, triangulated. What I'd like to do is, because more than any other Muslim rituals, near or far, Muharram recalls a completely different holy festival from another faith altogether. Scholars of Shiism actually have uh, claimed and pointed out that the unlikely affinities between Shiism and Catholicism, from the idea of transubstantiation of the soul to the proliferation of saints and the veneration of saints. So perhaps we can add another spoke to this wheel and talk about Muharram um, with Carnival, but reverse. So if you will, let's think about Carnival. In Carnival, we have these Samba schools that are training all year round, uh, all year for this one event, kind of crescendo an event. Similarly, in Iran, we have uh, we have. Uh, drumming schools as well in the streets of Tehran and other Shias uh, countries as you can also find in the Caribbean where, where Shias were, uh, were immigrants from the British Empire and you have this kind of competition between them as you'll see here And the dress code, of course, if in, in, uh, during Muharram is black because of commemoration. I think the dress code is the opposite in, in uh, Carnival, where it's closer to kind of Pantone flesh. Um, feathers, of course, play an important role in, in Carnival. Um, they're used by Africans as a kind of uh, syncretic symbol in, uh, on masks, and it's kind of ability to ri of humans to rise above problems of, of the earth. 
about abrupt pain and, and heartbreak and illness to travel to other worlds. Similarly, the processions of, of, of uh, Muharram also employ feathers for this uh, syncretistic function. This alam, which you see here, is a kind of the flag bearer, standard bearer that carries a, a special significance. The body of, of Hussein was, it was marking the body of Hussein that, that was uh, carried on a beer, a funeral beer afterwards. And if the drink of choice in, in Carnaval is uh, beer or rum, then the drink of choice in Muharram is decidedly uh, less fun. Um, it's hot milk or tea. But we can also think about the, the floats. Of course, we know about the floats, these incredibly uh, intricate, exquisite, and uh, expensive floats that are paraded around uh, Rio de Janeiro. But um, Muharram has its own types of floats, a bit more uh, vernacular and grassroots. This is called a hejle, which is a funeral structure that's decorated with portraits of recently deceased people. So we see the, the again the the way that Muharram has become a larger than a, than a Muslim phenomenon here, for example, where in India the the floats are put into the water like the River Ganges during Hindu rituals of Ganesh and sort of let float away. Or quite what's it, what's interesting is when it comes full circle, as I mentioned, the British Muslim immigrants to the Caribbean were Shias, so they brought Muharram and actually now they rub shoulders and sometimes it happens at the same time of year. Because, the, because Muharram follows the, the lunar calendar that you have Muharram and Carnival happening in the same street um, one by sort of, a, let's say, local Caribbeans and, and others by a generation of immigrants, Muslim immigrants. But perhaps more than floats, the real exemplary craft of Muharram is the banners. Again, if you think about Catholic banners and processions and Catholicism that, uh, that, that use these banners as well, here you have the names of the Prophet's family that were with uh, Hussein on this fateful day, but there's often this kind of um, this lozenge that's left empty here, and a picture of a family member which is um, left, which is pinned on. So what happens is people, in fact, incorporate their own histories, their own contemporary sort of stories into this 1,300-year-old um, ceremony. As you can see here again, a picture of a recently deceased, and you can see the empty box here, which is left for this kind of customization. We use these banners in this project, Friendship of Nations, Polish Shiite Shogas, um, which looked at this relationship between Poland and Iran from the 17th century to the 21st century in Sharjah. And this is actually where, I, where Maureen and I met um, a couple years ago. Yet the story is not as simple as these binaries, I suggest. Because despite, or perhaps because of this public mourning, this intensive display of, of public grief, there's a palpable sense of exhilaration, of joy, in the streets of, of, uh, of cities during this uh, Muharram. So, as you know, public space is often circumscribed in, in countries such as Iran, where sort of women and men can't mix. But it comes alive with the era of a street party during Muharram. So actually, it, it changes a bit from something which is sad to something quite happy. Normally when people have seen images of Muharram, you've seen in the, in the nightly news these kind of mediatized, very uh, sort of sensationalist images of people hitting themselves in the back until, to the point that they bleed, or even sort of um, wounding themselves in the forehead with a dagger, which is very, very rare. Um, but it's been, up, it's been updated actually quite a bit. And I'll just show you a clip here where these, these naked bodies, of course, um, reach in a sort of, it's the equivalent of a rave today, almost in Iran. <laughs> And you can hear the kind of the 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 
it's also the only moment, uh, the, the nighttime, which has become um, off limits since the Re Iranian revolution of 79, that the night you're allowed to sort of be in, in public space at night um, during these, this month of Muharram. Do you remember these studies of the, gay, the gays in cinema, you, like uh, scopophilia, the, the gaze of, uh, onto sort of female stars and sort of gender studies? But in fact here, it's, it's actually uh, another case where it's a reversal. So normally this gaze, which is traditionally projected onto women, is reversed. It's the men who are performing and the women who are sort of standing back and watching the men uh, perform during this uh, during the ceremony. And they sort of, everybody dresses up. It becomes a kind of a, a, uh, a little bit of a, of a pickup sort of spot in sorts. Now the reason why we're looking at Iran more than any other place is because it's the country that has most effectively instrumentalized this perpetual protest that's at the heart of Shiism. The archetypical story of rising up against oppression, uh, or against injustice, or against uh, tyranny, has not only been a pro protest against something, mm. but also sometimes for something. So no, nowhere on such a large scale as in certain um, key moments in Iran's history. So this idea of Moharm has been marketed, for example, in the 15th century, in fact, one of the, the issues that's um, causing a quite a lot of uh, trouble and or one of the points that, that, that really sort of pissed off a lot of Turks was the naming of this bridge, this third bridge across the Bosphorus after a, a sultan who would, uh, who would massacred lots of Shias. In the 15th century, Iran um, converted in mass to Shiism. And one of the reasons they did so, Persia at the time, was to create a kind of coherent Iranian identity that had been lost or been sort of at risk since the Arab invasions or since the, that brought Islam. So they wanted to distinguish themselves from their neighbors. Who were the neighbors at the time? Was the, the Ottoman Sultan who was Sunni on the left of Iran and the uh, Uzbek Khanid, um, the Shaybanid uh, Empire, which is on the right. And you can see it here. Iran was sort of, sort of surrounded by, by Sunni states. So it, it took on this sort of mass conversion as a way to kind of assert its own identity. Three centuries later, in the 1930s, <coughs> on the heels of a coup and a, new, and a newly minted dynasty, Reza Shah banned Muharram because, in the rituals, because he was concerned that these rituals in public display could be used against him. He understood that this is a protest movement, even if it's a protest movement about something that happened 1,300 years ago. He understood the dangers, and the recent U.S. invasion of Iraq showed us very well that sons end up realizing what their fathers' sort of uh, worst fears. It happened with Bush, and it happened with Reza Shah as well. In the 1970s, um, Mahmoud Reza Shah was invariably cast as the kind of Yazid. So we keep coming back to these tropes, almost like folklore. Yazid being the the, the caliph again, who is uh, the kind of the, the bad guy, and Hossein being the good guy. Khomeini was cast as the good guy, and the Shah is the, is the bad guy. The kind of Khomeini is the true path of Islam, bringing people back to kind of Islam, and and, and uh, the Shah is a kind of a decadent path. And later, again, the Iran-Iraq war presented a perfect scenario because you had a secular Ba'athist ruler who was in Iraq, exactly where this uh, whole uh, or historical event happened. Saddam was cast as, as Yazid and, um, and Khomeini as, as, as Hussein. And troops, this is a propaganda poster, so children, of course, were sent to the fronts uh, to fight. But what happened was that they were using these, these uh, you can see, again, this kind of uh, the picture of, of Hossein's face is covered. Because traditionally, technically, you're not supposed to show figuration, of course, or faces in Islam. But this is a contemporary image, of course, put against the backdrop of, uh, of something which happened more than a thousand years ago. And in the early part of this century, this, the first Islamic theocracy since the 11th century, so the first theocracy in a thousand years, hit a wall. After three decades in power, several purges, a revolution, and an eight-year war with Iraq that, left, that led a million people dead, there was finally a thaw in the early 2000s, and the Iranian revolution was beginning to eat its own children. The regime's ideology of, of, of revolutionary Islam, they read the, the kind of the playbook of their antithesis, the Russian revolution, and exported itself throughout the region and positioned itself in the vacuum that was left by the fall of the Soviet Union. So this is very interesting. Again, think about the fact that a theocratic Muslim regime takes its cues from an atheist communist regime. 
Um, just like communism, uh, kind of Bolshevism, was first about getting out foreign influences in 1917, kicking the British out, kicking the kind of German influence out, and then it exported its ideology, of course, to Central Asia, to Central America, South America, Southeast Asia. It's, Iran did the same thing. That's why today Iran has sort of several fingers in many pies, and if you go look at actually this week's issue of, uh, of The Economist, the, the, the cover story is, can Iran be stopped? The question is, is, is it's, only, it's the only country that has all these uh, sort of, uh, this kind of expansionist role in the Middle East, whether it's with the role of Kurds, whether it in, uh, in Iraq, whether it's the support of Hezbollah in, in, um, in Lebanon, whether it's the financing of uh, Karzai's government in Afghanistan, half of Iraq, of course, is Shia, listens to Iran, and, uh, or Syria and supporting the, the Assad regime. So you have this kind of anti-imperialist imperialism. First you're anti-imperialist, then you become imperialist yourself. And again, here you can see these kind of cut and paste Lenin on the left, Gerasimov, the famous Litsitsky Lenin at the tribunal, on the right, in the, in the main picture, Nawab Safavi, uh, uh, an, an Islamist, 1950s Islamist who was executed. Or just like you always have Khamenei shows himself next to Khomeini to kind of bolster his legitimacy, you have a similar thing that reminds us of Stalin with Lenin, always sort of showing himself next to, to Lenin to remind people, sort of, uh, to reassure people that he's a kind of continuous uh, the successor. And of course, you have the visual language that's exported as well. Klutzis on the left, anti-Shah propaganda on the right. So Muharram goes green in, in 2009. What happened when in 2009, if you remember the protest movement that happened after the elections, mm, the very tension that was in the, in the name of the country came to the foreground. So the country is called the Islamic Republic of Iran. Now, if you're in a, a theocracy, you don't care about being a republic. You care about your, your answer. You answer only to God. If you're a republic, you have to answer to your constituents to some degree. So this kind of these two names, these two these kind of uh, again, you could talk about a kind of metaphysical splits that doesn't. You can't actually have these two uh, ex coexist without some sense of tension. It could be a productive tension, but unfortunately, in the, in in recent years, it's become quite a destructive one. So following these 2009 elections. The man who was supposed to win, who was defrauded from his vote, the gentleman here, Musavi, whose name is also Mir Hossein. So people would write graffiti on the right. You see, it says Ya Hossein. Ya Hossein means long live Hossein. We always say Ya Hossein, Ya Ali, meaning ya, long live Hossein. But of course, it's a double meaning. Ya Hossein here, instead of saying Ya Hossein, Ya Hossein, it says Ya Hossein, Mir Hossein, meaning like long live Hossein, long live Mir Hossein. This guy here. So it's a kind of a a double entendre. And we can push this parallels even further for a kind of paranoid reading. Just like there was Trotsky, who was supposed to succeed Lenin, but at the last moment was sort of sidelined uh, because of his sort of questionable revolutionary credentials. In Iran, we also had a gentleman named Montazeri. Here, he's on the top of a building. He was supposed to lead the country after Khomeini, but he criticized the execution of political prisoners and was removed and held under house arrest for the rest of his life. Fortunately, just as the protest movement was losing steam in 2009, because they're kind of at some point you have to you have to evolve, like we're seeing in Taksim, or we'll probably see in in, in Brazil as well, is you have to kind of turn it into the, the momentum for a, a quite an organ a sort of a organizational protest movement. It has to become a kind of a, a more um, take different venues. Just as as the regime was starting to crack down on these protests, Montazeri dies, and he is a grand ayatollah. So again, with his death. Uh, it started again. It, it became a kind of a, a premise to get gathered in the streets and, and gave a kind of a new wind to the to the to these um, this uh, green movement. Now what's interesting about this Tazia is a kind of condolence theater. There's three registers of time in one play. There's literal time, which is what's happening uh, in front of you. There's representational time, which is what they're representing, um, let's say a thousand years ago. And then there's these, what we call anachronisms, uh, or uh, concurrence, which is all of a sudden in a play from the about the 11th century, Napoleon shows up.
or Alexander the Great shows up, or Genghis Khan shows up. So you have these kind of complete non sequiturs that come on the stage. Tazia was often performed in ritual, sort of rural settings. And the, the good guys, let's say Hossein's followers, are in, in green, and Shimra is in red. This is a gentleman who was the first person to write down the Passion Plays um, in, uh, in, uh, in the 19th century. These Passion Plays, many people claim that the reason why the, the Passion Play existed, or the, the, why the kind of resemblance with Christian Passion Plays, is because when, when Islam arrived into, um, into Iran, there was a sizable uh, population of Nestorian Christians in Iran at the time. Iran was quite Christian, even it was largely Zoroastrian, but there was a good population of Christians as well. And the relationship between, let's say, Christianity and Shiism is, is, a, is as I mentioned in the beginning, it's one kind of very s concise uh, way of putting it is, if you think about it, why did Islam first arrive in the seventh century? It arrived as a reformist movement. Every religion is a reform on the previous religion. Just like Christianity was kind of a, a, an attempt to reform Judaism, Islam was, a, was an attempt to reform Christianity, what they consider to be excessive idol, idol, sort of idols, false idols. So that's why in Sunnis are considered to be a reform movement, not, not allowing any representation. You have the sacred geometry and no pictures of people, no animals. And that's why Sunnis accuse Shias of Christianizing Islam. Because with the arrival of, of, of Shiism, we reintroduced mystery into the idea of, of, uh, of Islam, which didn't have this. We have saints, which didn't exist before. We have pictures of, of our, of our uh, imams. And we also have this idea that there's a 12th imam who's going to come back at some point at the end of time, just like Jesus is supposed to come back. Now, this theater in the round was used where spectators at times mingled with actors. It became a kind of poor man's brecht, if you will. Directors would get on stage during the performance and they would give indications to the actors in notes. And the actors would get on stage also reading notes, not because they didn't know the lines, but because, again, t technically, if, you, if, you're act if you're embodying the prophet's family, that's blasphemy. So you have to always remind your audience that actually you're an actor and you're only watching a play. And so it became a kind of poor man's avant-garde um, and one that was uh, known for... Um, and quite celebrated by the 70s theater directors. For example, um, um, Peter Brook and uh, Tadeusz Kantor and uh, Jerzy Gratowski, they considered Muharram as, as, as quite inspirational for their plays of, uh, of poor theater. And, um, and Peter Brook, in fact, restaged uh, Conference of the Birds, which is a famous Sufi kind of uh, epic uh, in the Sahara, based on this notion of taking theater to places that, that didn't have indigenous theater. Um, Tazir, this, this, uh, this Muharram passion play, is the f only form of indigenous theater in the Middle East. It's the, f it's the only, it's, until theater arrived with colonialism of the British and the French, there was no notion of theater in the Middle East except for Tazir. And Peter Brooks said himself, I saw in a remote Iranian village, one of the strongest things I've ever seen in theater, a group of 400 villagers, the entire population of the place sitting under the tree and passing from roars of laughter to outright sobbing, although they knew perfectly well this, the end of the story. As they saw Hossein in danger of being killed, then fooling his enemies, and then being martyred. And when he was martyred, I saw the theater had become truth. This is what Peter Book said. Oops. Yeah, do. Was your son? Bale. Asa, I'm a Batafloom. تو زن ها افتاده بود یه زن حامل نشسته بود این اسب به اون وزنش حاجا هم روش نشسته بود افتاد رو شکن اون خانمی که نزدیک بود به زایمان 20 روز مونده بود به زایمان تقریبا یه گدی جیغ داد گفتن که این زنم مرد و زن میگه زنم مرد بچه هم مرد بعد این زن گفت نه مادام سالم هستم اسبم بلند شده گفت من چیزی زن گفت من چیزی نیست این اسب اون میخوادم هستم اون اسبم حاجا دوباره با سوار و اسب شد خواندن بعد سال بعد که شد این خانم 
این بچه رو آورد حاج آقا آبادان به زیر دروش بزن زد دوباره برد آورد آبادان به لبش بزن زد دوباره برد آورد حاج آقا آبادان خودت رو به پیشانیش بزن گفتم بخار تو الان سه مرتبه بچه میاد گفت این بچه همون بچه ای است که تو شکم من در سال گذشته بود من اون رو حامله بودم حاج آقا با اسب افتاد رو شکم من الحمدلله منم سالم هستم این بچه‌م سالمه به معجزه آقای امام حسین به معجزه حضرت علی اصغر الان علی اصغر شد آورد پیش حاج آقا So this story, did everybody, was everybody able to read the subtitles? Essentially a horse during a performance fell on a pregnant woman. And instead of what we would normally associate with a kind of tragic moment, instead of this woman never going back to this play that happens every year in her village, instead of kind of shrinking away and allowing this thing to fester and become a taboo and surrendering to a kind of a hypothetically destructive outcome, what she does is she embraces this act and recuperates it as a kind of benediction, as a blessing onto her child. And so she wants her child to play this, this actor this, in the play when he grows up. And we've often embraced the advantages of kind of intellectual acrobatics, like we just said, this kind of metaphysical splits. But this sense of agility and balance and coordination is, is of another order altogether. What's interesting also about this theater becoming truth is that when people play Hossein or the, the kind of the good guy's family, let's say the prophet's family, they're treated throughout the year the 11 months of the year when they don't play the, the character, they're treated in their local villages or neighborhoods as kind of good guys. People bring them cakes. And the bad guys are teased for the rest of the year. So you're not picked on to the sense of sort of in a, in a, in a violent way, but people will always sort of say, aha, yeah, I, I can't trust you because you're, you're, you're Shimra or you're on Shimra's side. So it's like you're taking the actual parameters of the play into everyday life for the rest of the calendar year as well. So on Ashura, the tenth day of the month of Muharram, this climax builds to a moment when Hossein's tent originally was put on fire by the troops of the Caliph at roughly noon that day. These are pictures from Tehran, 2011, 2011-12 uh, Ashura, a year and a half ago. And you can see the crowd waiting as far as the eye can see in downtown Tehran near the bazaar for this tent to be put to fire. Now what's interesting is children Children tell another story. They look, but they don't need the artifice of theater or, or liturgy to actually see the joy that's happening within this otherwise tragic series of events. I don't know how y'all see it, but when it comes to the children, who Tang is for the children. We teach the children. So, Old Dirty Bastard also was known as Big Baby Jesus, as some of you will know. And Big Baby Jesus reminds us of this focus on children that the Wu-Tang had. Now the Wu-Tang, if you think about the Wu-Tang, there is a similarly decentralized group of very strong personalities who cultivate an aura of cosmic sort of occult transcendence, and they command a near religious following amongst people, and they trade in sort of shades of mysticism, and it reminds us of another kind of group. Now these tiny tots, the stories of children, provide an interesting insight into how Muharram is an act of joy through mourning. This is a, a kind of a, a, a recurring symbol. Is This is the son of Hussein who received a, uh, an arrow in his neck. So he holds up his, from the, he holds up his, his son as a kind of sacrifice. Uh, not a sacrifice, but sort of showing that, that he's even lost his only son. And the stories of the Battle of Karbala involve lots of children, but in particular two. Hossein's daughter and his son. The son is named Ali Ashar, who you saw in the, the child playing at the end of the, the, the clip. And the daughter is named Sakine. Now, Ali Ashar is on the left and Sakine is on the right. The, the imagery, of course, is very melodramatic, but one of the stories says that Hossein's brother, who is Abul Fazl, here on the right, um, was a, a great warrior. and. Abul Faz had a very rela strong relationship with his niece, Hossein's daughter, Sakine. And everybody is, is, of course, cut off from water for several days. And he can't stand the fact that his, this young girl is, is dying of thirst. So he manages to break through the ranks of the Caliph's army, get to the, the Euphrates River, and get some water. And before he even drinks himself, he, the legend has it that he takes the water and first wants to give it to his, his brother's family before he drinks any himself. But tragically, on the way back, he's shot with an arrow, he loses one arm, then he grabs it with the other arm, then he puts it in his mouth, he loses both arms, and he never gets there. Now, um, this, uh, this story of, uh, of thirst has become a very important 
trope in, in Shiism as well. That's why outside of uh, Shia mosques, you have a very beautifully adorned water fountain, sort of a public water fountain, which is actually quite nice if you think about this kind of, we have this return to drinking tap water now uh, in, in Europe and in, in America that we're not supposed to be polluting the environment so much. Um, but uh, water fountains are, some, are kind of always placed in the most disastrous and dire places, sort of right next to restrooms and airports or kind of they're forgotten spaces of, 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 of public uh, consumption of water. And on the fourth day of Muharram, mothers dress up their children, uh, their, their sons in green, and they, they reenact this moment. Again, they offer them in symbolic sacrifice. Now think about it, this is usually, everything we're taught is the opposite of this, is you're never supposed to tempt fate by putting your son in the position, even sort of uh, symbolically, of, a, of, such a, of such a destiny, of sort of being, receiving an arrow in, in the neck. And this is the female version of this collective mourning. All these stories that were being told by the child in the beginning, by the man later, where everybody's crying, these public crying, these are all these little stories, these kind of epics uh, of, of what happens to the Prophet's family leading up to the battle and after the battle. Some of the kids are old enough to understand what's happening. Very clearly, they cry. But most of them are too busy having fun, sort of wondering why mommy or daddy's crying, climbing in and out of their arms, um, and accessing directly, without all this artifice, uh, or the reenactment or drama, the joy that underlines, underlies these morning processions. Even the cars cry. Even their lights cry. Now, this, as I mentioned, reverse joy is, 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 is one installment in this cycle of work, the current cycle of work, our third cycle of work, called the Faculty of Substitution. We first, um, the, the image of, of the fountains you've been seeing in, uh, in each chapter is, was a fountain in Mashhad, the third holiest city in, 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 in Iran, in Shia uh, Iran. And we, we just, actually, Natasha Saad Haririan, the artist, she has said that uh, the Iranian, the Islamic Republic is the best conceptual artist in the world because they think of things that you would never actually think about. For example, when we saw this fountain, what we immediately thought of, at night we saw it, we thought, wow, this fountain is actually, it's red, and, uh, and we never thought about a red fountain, right? And in the morning we wake up and we see that actually the fountain is red. They actually dyed the water red. And, um, and what we notice is that just like sort of, let's say, communism in Islam or Mohammed and Marx or, Pol or Poland and Iran or Carnival and Muharram, we notice that this, by dyeing this fountain red, there's actually a completely two ends of the spectrum you, that, that uh, you bring together. First of all, it's the political manipulation of violence in the most cynical way, is how to use violence or how to use death and martyrdom as a way to, whether it's wars that we fight in, around the world or whether it's uh, sending young children to, 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 to the front like what happened in Iraq, happened in Iran during the Iraq war, or, or suicide bombers, for example. But on the other hand, children, they don't see this, uh, this question of violence. They see in red the complete sort of naive festivity. They think it's Kool-Aid or sort of juice. So they want to immediately go to this sort of, they're drawn to this red symbol. So you have on one side the completely naive and on the other side the, 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 the kind of the wholly cynical and violent. And we first staged this in uh, the first place ironically, or I wouldn't say ironically, the first place that invited us to do this public intervention was of all places for a Shia fountain was Jerusalem. And this, the, the town hall organized it, but the people in the town hall were clear about what it meant. They didn't like the associations with sort of terrorism or with the violence inflicted on the Palestinians. So they kept turning off the water. And the children, of course, had no problem with this. So we had to keep getting the thing turned on. Then it was staged in, uh, in, in Poland's uh, Łódź, uh, which is a city also that has seen its own share of tragedy. This sense of, of, of another installment of this faculty of substitution is a story of, of uh, syncretism I mentioned, not Moscow, not Mecca, the book that we published, um, where we tell the story of syncretism in Central Asian Islam through the perspective of fruits that people can literally interact with. There's sculptures, but there's also real fruits that people are supposed to eat and people do eat and, and, and read the book. And it turns things on its head uh, in the sense that um, it's actually the women who are maintaining the, tr the traditions 
these oral traditions of Islam, as opposed to the men who during 70 years of communism had to be communist in public space. But in private, it was the women who were kind of maintaining uh, their, their cultural traditions. The, the third installment of this uh, faculty substitution was a book called <sighs> You have this sound or letter in your alphabet, but, but, but many languages don't. And uh, it's, uh, it's considered to be a kind of a, a sacred, uh, sacred phoneme or sacred sign in, uh, in, in Arabic uh, script, which is this one, <laughs> in Hebrew, <laughs> and this is the Russian Cyrillic, which of course comes from your alphabet. Um, and um, and so this this there's been a surprising tolerance for complexity in the global wave of protest that we've been seeing the past uh, couple of years against social and economic equality uh, inequality. Um, after all, these challenges that face us, you can't they well, face society can't be addressed in isolation. We can't talk about education without talking about sort of taxation, without talking about employment, without talking about. Uh, civil, civil institutions. Nonetheless, the role of faith or spirituality is something which is, or even organized religion, is always kept at a distance, um, sort of quarantined by leftist intellectuals in the West, but also liberals in the, in the Middle East. Um, as Matt Mullican, I went to a talk by Matt Mullican in the Pompidou uh, about a couple months ago, and he said, if you, want the, the, if you want to get people to run away from you in our world, just start talking about religion and spirituality. They start running for the doors. It's the best way to get rid of people. And yet, I would argue that you only have to look at the whitewashed sort of absorption of, of successful civil disobedience, disruptive figures of civil disobedience, from Gandhi to Martin Luther King, to even the Catholic Church during, during Solidarność, I would argue there's almost not a case, or not as, almost well, most of the cases of, of successful civil disobedience have always employed a very strong element of faith. And yet we approach these people, we, we remember these people as quasi-secular leaders. This grassroots, bottom-up sort of self-organization today is considered de facto uh, a way to challenge the stasis of entrenched power. But very little is said of another directional urgency, not just bottom-up, but let's say inside-out. And to what extent can a revolution of the inner world impact the revolution of the outer world surrounding us? Now, Cassandras, they like to say that we've been here before. We saw it in 1968. We saw it in 1917. We saw it in, in, um, in uh, 1848. The, the financial meltdown of the Arab Spring, of the Arab uprisings, that basically we've been here before. And they're not mistaken, we have been here before. It's simply their tone which lacks the necessary mirth or joy for these dour, kind of depressing warnings, they, what they do is they actually, they, they misunderstand, or they, they, they portray a simplistic, linear, and literal understanding of time, and a very sort of simplistic understanding of the exoteric and esoteric, much less of joy and mourning itself. And they, when, you, when people kind of warn you that, you know, we've been here before, look what happened. The Egyptians, the Iranians tell the Egyptians, we were there, look what happened to us in 79. We also thought we were gonna be liberated. but. Repetition is not something to be avoided. I would argue it's something to be celebrated. And as Moharam rituals point out, we have been here before, and we plan to be here again every day of every week, every week of every month, and every month of every year. Thank you. I think it was that kind of cafe, or the any, yeah, of course, any questions, or we can do it formally, informally. It's, I should start, start by saying that there are, sometimes pe people are, are hesitant to ask questions because there's so much new information that they feel that uh, it's, uh, you know, even this pedagogical turn of art that we talked about recently, it's, uh, we find a, a little bit of a problem with this because um, we never position ourselves as experts on the region. It's, we, you can't be an expert on such a large region between the former Berlin Wall and the Great Wall of China. I think nobody's an expert on that region. Um, but, uh, and in fact, we started as a book club, so it's really about, our practice is really about sharing knowledge or sharing research and inviting people to, sort of to participate in that research along the way and not about sort of a traditional uh, sense of sort of we knowing something and somebody else not knowing. So. Aren't all religions based on grief and rebellion? 
I don't. Um, I think interestingly, the, w the one example which comes to mind, which isn't based on that, is Zor Zoroastrianism, because Zoroastrianism, being the first monotheistic religion, is actually a very joyous religion. And the proof for me is, because they say, is in the pudding. Zoroastrians can't. You cannot become Zoroastrian. You have to be born it. And yet, so Zoroastrianism is slowly dying out. And yet, you would imagine if somebody's slowly dying out, they would be kind of very sad are very distressed, but actually they're kind of going into extinction with a, an enormous smile on their face. So uh, I don't know. It's uh, that's an example. I guess that's one example. Of, I don't know much about uh, religions beyond uh, the kind of the the, the Abrahamic the Abrahamic yeah, faiths. Yeah, the, the Abrahamic faiths. Let's say the three major uh, religions. I I don't know. Um, I also noticed that your um, presentation tone was very, quite unique. Normally when in the artwork, as you say, you speak about spirituality, everyone flees, as you mentioned, or you can only speak about it in an ironic way. You seem to speak about it with earnestness and historical perspective, but without the, in a sense, religious as well. How do you combine that kind of split? Um, it's to tell you the truth uh, we're, we're obviously a collective and as Marina mentioned there's two of us in this collective there's others as well but let's say two kind of founding members and and I was a, a kind of a hardcore dialectical materialist until maybe age 30 like if it didn't exist right here I didn't believe in it and I think that what I've I think part of what Slavs and Tatars has been for us is is was was the end of the reason we started Slavs and Tatars was kind of the end of a western promise if you will we had studied in sort of great institutions in the West. We had lived in the great cities of New York, London, and Paris. We sort of checked all those boxes, and I don't want to sound ingra ungrateful. It formed us very much, but something was missing. And for me, that was, for example, a different form of knowledge. I, I can tell you that my education taught me how to succeed, but it didn't necessarily teach me uh, sort of very basic wisdoms that, that, of course, a lot of wisdom comes with experience, but, but you know, we're we're taught in a kind of uh, whether it's whether whether again it's a kind of the the quarantining of, of of spirituality or religion or even religious texts to even to study religious texts in a non-cerebral way. What's important for us is that we books for us are almost sacred things because books they're like talismans. We publish a book and you don't know what happens to it. You can take it and read it on the toilet. You can read it in breakfast. You give it up one day and somebody else picks it up. It, it really has a kind of, it has a power. And we forget that books and texts can be read beyond simply cerebrally or analytically. Sometimes people have emotional relationships with books. Sometimes people have almost digestive, corporal relationships with books, um, which is why uh, we have this, uh, this pro one of my favorite sort of recent projects, which is one of the most difficult projects we have which is called Kitab Kebab. Um, and it's, uh, I can see if I can find it here. Kitab uh, um, Kebab is basically several books into which a skewer of kebab is actually stuck. And, um, and the reason why we, this is quite an important piece for me is that uh, is it talks about there's three types of knowledge, if you will. There's at least, there's more than three types, but the main brush strokes are there's horizontal knowledge, which is very Anglo-American, which you know we know a little bit about everything, Americans. But we don't know much about we don't know very much about anything in the end. But German sort of Russian knowledge is very vertical. You know these great brains and know everything about sort of mathematics and one sort of theorem of mathematics and nothing about anything else. And, uh, and what we try to kind of do is, is, is do what we call sort of the transversal, which is to combine the scope of, or the rigor of vertical knowledge with the scope of horizontal knowledge. Of course, it's doomed to fail, like many things, like all revolutions are doomed to fail. Um, but also it talks about the idea of, of books being something that you have other, other than an analytical relationship with. You have like, a, like something you really almost, you know, you have a digestive relationship with text sometimes. And, um, and of course, it's also just on a personal level very difficult to skewer your own books because I can't read these books anymore, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, we didn't make it kind of, we're not sophisticated enough to make it where you could take a piece off and read it and put it back. So, um, 
But to your point about spirituality and sort of religion, um, there's another thing which I think I wanted to just briefly talk about, which is this also, I think, like re the treatment of religion, the treatment of politics and art is also something we realize is very much, uh, as often we talk, there's an understanding that political art has to be self-serious, has to be dour, has to be <coughs> lecturing you and, and talking at you. And that's why I mentioned the beginning, of the sort of quite right after the talk, is that we don't believe in confrontational art. We don't believe in scandal and controversy. We, we think that's, that's the dumbest way to actually reach anybody and speak to anybody. And the reason I bring this image up is, as I, we, Marina and I were just talking about, in the Sharjah Biennial, if you remember, there was a, a controversy about one of the pavilions being censored. And the director of the Sharjah Found Art Foundation, Jack Persekian, was fired unceremoniously because this, this piece right here, the pavilion right here next to ours, was, uh, had writings that the Algerian army that was raping people using the word of Allah, they wrote these phrases on mannequins. It was very, not a very elegant work, but you can argue whether it should, the, it should have been censored or not. That's not really what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the fact that this project was called Friendship of Nations, Polish Shiite Showbiz. It talks about civil disobedience between Iran, 2009, and Poland, anti-sort anti of solidarity movement, anti-communist movement. It's next to the only Shia mosque in an overwhelmingly Sunni country, in Sharjah, the Emirates, and it opens the same day of the Arab Spring that Saudi Arabia and Emirates sent troops into Bahrain, an overwhelmingly Shia country. So we had like every ingredient possible to make this into kind of a controversial uh, um, pavilion, and, and yet it was the opposite. Nobody uttered a peep, and, and it was arguably one of the more um, successful pavilions in the sense that locals came, butchers came, bakers came. People called it the kind of kindergarten on the way to the mosque because you'd sort of come and drop off your kids and go to the mosque and pray because it was fun. And the challenge for us is, the real challenge is how can you deliver critique, um, political work, but with a with a, a huge smile on your face? Describe. We don't have the vocabulary partly because it escapes language, because it's not of, it's an affective experience, it's not a, a, a linguistic maybe experience, but also because we don't pay enough attention to it to have that arsenal of words to describe it, I think. Any more questions? Maybe in private. <laughs> Sorry? Maybe in private. Yes, thank you for coming, and I hope to see you um, in, in Samos, Samos in, in August. <laughs>